Okay, welcome back, and um, welcome to week six. Uh, this week we turn to um, two philosophers in our uh, modern period who are going to advance what um, philosophers called a dualism, um, or dualism. Uh, Anton Wilhelm Amo, who lived between 1703 and 1759, so he's an 18th century figure. You all read... Um, an excerpt and heard Peter Adamson talk about um, his dissertation um, with a big long title, the first the first substantive noun of which is the impassivity of the soul. He publishes this in 1734. Adamson gave us his life story and his um, his, you know, his his birth in Ghana, his enslavement, his um, life in Europe as a slave, and then as a PhD student and as a, a, a doctor of philosophy who you know, writing and publishing philosophy who eventually goes back to um, uh, he goes back to uh, uh, Akan his to his people and becomes something of a diviner and a prophet of sorts which sort of takes him back to our takes him takes him to in, in effect the astrological tradition the African astrological tradition that we that, that, that there was at least some material posted on for you guys earlier in the semester and we're also going to look at Descartes who is a Who's, who's living and writing in the earlier century. So he's a, he's a, um, a 17th century, um, a 17, born, born at the very end of the um, 16th century. He's a 17th century figure whose very famous book, um, Meditations on First Philosophy, is published in 1641. So just under 100 years before Amos is um, published. And as Adamson points out, Amo is um, uh, taking on De Descartes directly and by name and disagreeing in particular, with the with the with the dualism that Descartes advances, almost dualism is different, and so we're going to look at both of those and um, and uh, focus on both the the sort of intellectual uh, run up to the views that these guys are advancing and that they're arguing for and disagreeing about and so on, you know, some of the some of the some of the implications of that disagreement, and also. Um, the aftermath, what what dualism in the modern period produces in Western philosophy, because this is um, Descartes' meditations is um, considered sort of the um, I mean, if you thought of like if you thought of like the history of Western philosophy, sort of like um, the New Jersey Turnpike, if 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 you will, um, the first rest stop, the first stop on the New Jersey Turnpike of West, the Western philosophical tradition in the modern period. So, you know, we're in the, in the section of the turnpike that we're, you know, we're calling the modern period. I know I'm mixing this metaphor fiercely, but you'll know what I mean. That first rest stop is called Descartes' meditations, and in particular, um, his dualism, his dualism. You guys have probably encountered in, you know, in jokes or memes or cartoons, possibly, um, uh, various and sundry riffs on, on Descartes' I think, therefore, I am. Um, uh, uh, the cogito argument that he gives us, which we will see today. You guys read it in um, the the it's the first and second, but primarily the second meditation. Um, we're going to look at we'll look we'll look briefly at that very famous argument. That's Descartes' earlier dualism. Amos is different. We're actually going to look at his first. Um, with the metaphysical backdrop, sort of following the story that I've been giving you guys up to this point, the focus the focus is more sharp. We, we focus more sharply on um, the uh, basically the effect of the emerging matter in motion metaphysics. This alternate view of the world, you know, rejecting Aristotelianism and Platonism and some of the animism or the vitalism that comes with that. I'm sorry about all the isms, um, and looking instead at most importantly, inert, inactive, we would say, you know, hard, concrete, physical matter, stuff, things, um, in motion as a way to explain the natural world. Well, that, that presents both opportunities and challenges to the theological view that, um, is, is, is held by, quite firmly, by, um, by the uh, the Western Christian Church at, at at this point, by the Catholic and the emerging Protestant denominations, um, that theological view with you know the, the monotheistic you know previously Judaic, now Christian now Islamic God, um, then as well, um, advances starts starts to explain the natural world 
by referring to matter in motion, but then it's got issues because of the importance of um, creative, active, all-powerful um, first causes, creators, spirit, in other words. And so we're entering a period, we're entering, we're entering a, a period in the semester um, and in, the, in this history where, where the theological tradition is like is taking up the science and taking it over and also trying to like solve problems that it has doing so it's so it's got pr issues it's got credibility issues um as we'll see in a, in a couple of weeks um descartes himself is um writing um an earlier work right at the time when um galileo's two world systems is both published and then burned banned and burned um and descartes actually sort of freaks out and says, I'm not going to publish my metaphysical stuff, my physical theories, um, because I can't, I mean, I can't get into the situation that Galileo got into. Um, we'll see, we'll see a little bit about that, um, that little bit of history. But this, this is sort of opening up, opening up the, um, the question of how this theological tradition handles the new science, this, this, how is it, what kind of a metaphysics is it going to come up with to, accommodate, reconcile the physics, the physical accounts of the natural world that are taking off and are getting so much credibility that they're, that unless the, unless the church, unless the, theo, the theologians and the theological thinkers get out in front of this, they're going to be, they're going to be outdated and they're not, they're not going to be able to compete. So I'm, I'm just giving you this sort of cartoon overview of the motivations so we can, so we can see what's going on here. In particular, what Descartes is is mo what he says what he says is his purpose in the meditations and you could say that you know he's worried he's already worried about um you know advancing new scientific conclusions and then upsetting church figures so i mean you could say well he's just saying this to appease them and to like say okay don't 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 ban me don't banish me don't put me in exile don't don't incarcerate me don't 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 give me any trouble over this but Descartes is also, you know, sincere about this. He's a he's a he's a he's a Christian. He's a believing Christian in his Catholic his Catholic Church, and um, he is advancing this advancing his philosophy as a better way to defend the truths of Christianity, the truths of his his Western monotheism, and in particular the the meditations, as we'll see in a bit, is offered to convince. He says he's he's going to convince non-believers which is actually a very funny group of people. We'll talk a little bit today about who actually counts as a non-believer. Descartes says he's, he's offering this as a way to convince non-believers of two primary conclusions, and these are crucial for the Western Christian church and for the monotheisms generally, although the different ones, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam come at this a little differently. Um, two truths, the soul is immortal, and God exists. Descartes very clear at the beginning of the meditations. I didn't make you read the preface and the run up and the dedication and all that, but he's quite clear that this is what he says. He's offering these, this, this, this philosophical argument for people. And he says, you know, believers and Pas Blaise Pascal had already said, you know, um, says in fact that, you know, believers, they don't need rational arguments for their belief. They already believe. Descartes holding out what he can, rational arguments, logical arguments, um, to convince people who don't believe, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute, there's a good, an, a completely solid, rational argument for these conclusions we should go ahead and believe. That tradition gets outdated pretty quickly. Um, uh, uh, people sort of give that up after a certain point, uh, more or less. Descartes is, in a way, sort of the height and the end of the big efforts in European philosophy to say, look, we're going to give you a logical argument for the existence of God, a logical argument for the immortality of the soul, so you need to believe as we do. Um, at the same time, this effort, these efforts by people like Descartes and Amo, um, end up producing... Um, consequences for the the new physics and the new metaphysics the new philosophy um because of the because of the implications for how we see the interaction between spirit and matter we're just going to be spending a lot of time uh thinking about that relationship um when we um when we turn to um bentley and to newton and to the leibniz clark correspondence and also they're going to be and this is this is this is in a sense the um those of you who've taken philosophy, other 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 philosophy classes, and have been reading material um, published in the 19th and the 20th century, so you've been exposed to some later material period periods after the one we're studying this semester. The focus tends to be on 
what we can know and how we can know it. Justified true belief, warranted assertion, um, knowledge, certainty, all of those um, areas of concern get recast in their most influential form by Descartes' argument here in the meditation. I mean, it's developed by other figures, and we'll see a bit of that, particularly next week when we read George Barclay. We'll get a, diff a different iteration on that on that particular problem. Um, but you, you saw in the first and second meditations, Descartes is extremely worried about error and falsehood and truth and especially certainty. And so I'll be talking about that later on also. So this is a this is a this week is sort of a pivot week where we, we we've got stuff coming and going um, things that we've already looked at things that have been in development for us and now the opening up of a whole bunch of new strands a couple of main new strands both in terms of epistemology and in terms of metaphysics okay Sorry to disappear on you. I'm here. Okay. Anton Wilhelm Amo, writing later in the 18th century in his impassivity dissertation, um, published in 1734, defended in 1734, um, makes a distinction, the same distinction that Descartes makes almost a century earlier, that we call as Adamson points out, we tend to call Cartesianism, Cartesian dualism. This is the famous Cartesian dualism. This is the distinction, we call it a distinction, between mind and body. And what that amounts to is, and Descartes quite clear about this um, uh, in, the, um, in, in the first two meditations that you read, the claim is that human beings are mind and body. Implied there for these guys is the claim, and this is very important for us this semester, that both on the epistemology side, the knowledge side, and on the physics, the metaphysics side, that body is completely different. It's a completely different substance, thing, uh, nature, than mind, spirit, soul. All the same thing for these guys. Mind, spirit, soul is one kind of substance, and it's actually a substance, right? Descartes in the second meditation says he's a thinking substance, he's a thinking thing. Body, matter, is a different kind of substance. Human beings, dualists like Amo and Descartes argue, are a, uni a, a union of soul and body. Now, those of you familiar with the... Um, the, the monotheistic religious traditions, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, should, fi should find this familiar. This is, this is in effect, the, um, the, the Judeo-Christian Islamic view of the created human soul in a body um, recast uh, in rationalist philosophical terms. And so that's what Amo is doing here, here in, in, his, in his impassivity book. Um, For Amo, the mind is active and the body is passive. Now this gets confusing because the title of the work we're looking at is the impassivity of the soul. The impassivity of the soul. There the word impassive, I mean the root is passive, it's the same word. What, 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 the, what the title of his work is saying and what Amo believes is that the, um, the mind is active and so it is not passive. The body is what is passive. And that means that the mind, the mind only acts. It only acts and nothing acts on it. This distinction is extremely important for these guys, not just when it comes to human souls, but also when it comes to talking about the nature of the universe. So we're gonna, it's gonna show up again and again and again. Um, but you can see it right here in Amo's title and in his main thesis against, um, it's, and it's actually a disagreement with Descartes. I mean, he's agreeing with Descartes about the distinction between mind and body and the, the claim that human beings are some kind of unity of mind and body. But for Amo, the mind is entirely active. It does not suffer or feel anything. 
anything. It does not, nothing happens to it. It only happens to other things. The body, on the other hand, has no action at all. It is, and this is a word that Newton and Bentley and um, all of these guys, Descartes, are going to, this is, this is a word they're going to use for material substance, the bodily substance, the matter half of this equation. Um, it is inert, and inert means not ert, not, not active, not w- without energy, without action. So the body is not active, it is completely passive, which means the body doesn't happen to anything. Everything happens to the body. Everything happens to the body. Human beings are, and this is, you know, largely attributed to the to the um, the special status that humans have in the in the biblical creation story. Human beings are in this very funky position of being both completely inert bodily substance and completely active for Amo now completely active, no passive um, spiritual substance. Spiritual substance. Um, so you can see in this 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 notion of um, in this notion of what it is to be a human being, you can see recapitulated, repeated the um, the basic metaphysical distinction between active creator God spirit. Now in this in this in this in this moment uh, uh, in this instance, preserving Aristotle's notion of a first mover, which is itself unmoved. Nothing happens to the first mover, but the first mover happens to everything else. Um, active spirit and um, matter, which is put into motion, body, which is which is completely passive into and on which spirit acts. Well, so lots of consequences and lots to say here. But you can see Amo is saying the mind is entirely active, and that's going to be a departure from Descartes, as we'll see. And the body is completely passive. What this means, and Amo. Amo is, is a, as I say here, it's a more radical dualism than Descartes. What this means is that only the body can have sensations. Sensations are, like if you think about like, um, if you feel hungry, right, you can't really, and I'll say some more about this later, but it's hard to like say, I mean, you can, you can sort of do mind over matter. By the way, that expression is coming from this tradition. Um, you could say, oh, well, I'm not really hungry. I mean, I'm not really hungry. Oh, but I am hungry. I'm sorry. I've made us all hungry right now. Um, <laughs> pause the video, get a snack. Um, uh, or if you, you know, if you, if you bang your elbow on the door frame or you stub, you know, you stub your toe on a piece of furniture, you can try very hard not to feel that pain or that, you know, the, the, the tingling sensation if it hits your funny bone, right? Um, the nerves there in your elbow, you can try. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not feeling this, but it's very difficult because you really are. And at, and in, and you know, in a, in a, in a, in a more immediate sense, in a little sort of less traumatic sense, like right now, you're, you're hearing my voice through the, through the, through the recording, and you're seeing the light that is, that is, that is being reflected off these surfaces, and you can say, oh, well, I can't see these colors, and I can't see Kathy moving her hands, and I can't hear her voice, but actually, you are. You are hearing them right now, and you can't really. It's it's not something you can argue about, right? It that's that's what it means to have sensations, to be passive, right? So the body only the body can have sensations for Amo. The mind cannot. The body the pa- the sensations that the body receives are passively received. They're not actively received. The body's not doing anything. It's not reacting. It's not interpreting. It's not translating. It's just like. Ooh. Right? It's just taking it. It's like it's like a stone hitting hitting the ground. It's the same thing. This is very different from the way we think of the body, which is you know full of full of a nervous system and nerve endings and all kinds of other. We don't we don't we don't think this way any longer. But there are residues of this of this kind of view in in particular in um, modern psychology. Um, even though as even though psychology is also the place where we see all the sophistication about you know the way that bodies are active as opposed to inactive. It, it's, it's nonetheless there. Um, so sensations passively received by the body, while the mind, when the body's having sensations, and Amo, this is mysterious. He leaves this as a mystery, and I have a feeling it's probably a residually theological mystery, because um, we'll see this is the place where he's disagreeing with Descartes, and it's a hard thing to explain. He says, look, I'm not doing it. Um, the mind when the body feels sensations, actively intends, 
And I, Kathy, would, what I would say to you when you're thinking about this word intend as opposed to, I intend to go to the store now. I mean, there's some element of that um, in Amo's view. But this is, this is actually an older medieval, this is actually an older medieval notion where mental substance, the mind, soul, or spirit, is conscious of the objects of sensation. So if you bang your elbow on the door frame, you've touched it and you've got like, bam, right? I can feel the wall there when I'm banging my elbow on it, hopefully not to alarm my housemates. Um, and um, I, I know that that my mind, according to Amo, my body has received that sensation perfectly passively, but the mind actively says, aha, a wall, or it has an image, or it has a representation, you, and different guys differ on this. Um, it becomes conscious of the object, but for Amo, that is a fully active consciousness. It's a fully active intention of, in that case, the wall. Um, so, so, the, uh, so, so the mind has this active, like it sort of takes up this sensation, but most importantly for Amo, and this can be difficult for us to think about, sensations that happen to the body do not cause those intentions. They do not cause those intentions. Now, the question then is, well, like, why does it happen that way? How does that work out? If, and, and, and as Adamson points out, Amo, Amo says, everything in the mind has come through sensation and experience. So to that extent, Amo has taken on the empirical, observational, new science um, view of the nature of human knowledge. I mean, everything we know comes from the senses, but he doesn't think that bodily passive experience is the cause of active mental consciousness of things, intentions in relation to things. Um, how that happens is something else. We'll see, and Adamson points out that, you know, Amo does not adopt, uh, and it's available to him at this point, Leibniz's notion of pre-established harmony between the soul and the body, where God actually, it's a little more complicated than this, but God actually sets up, oh, okay, if this is going to happen to the body, an idea over here is going to happen in the mind. God sets all that up for Leibniz. And we'll see that Leibniz is quite wild on these subjects. Um, Amo doesn't adopt that view, but there's some other kind of a non-relationship between the mind and the body such that the sensations passively received by the body are actively intended by and thought about by the mind without those sensations in any way causing that thought, because that would make the body active on the mind and the mind passive in relation to the body, which Amo completely rejects. The mind interacts with bodies, the bo it interacts with the body somehow, but it is active in doing so. So everything the mind is doing in relation to the body is outreach. It's all active. Nothing comes at the mind and like causes it to do anything. It's not passive in relation to the body at all. So for Amo, People, actual people, and this is really crucial for understanding um, the importance of Amo's view for um, the anti-slavery movement and for the for the for the um, the contemporaneous that is at that time criticisms of the enslavement, particularly of African peoples and, and in general. Um, for Amo, people are disembodied minds or souls. That is, if you're going to ask what people actually are. Who we really are is our minds, our souls, or our spirits. The body, and this is very counterintuitive, who are we? We are souls or minds or spirits. That's who the people actually are. The body lives and the body is alive. What is it that makes the body alive? Having sensations. That's what it is to be alive for Amo, is to have sensations. The body senses. However, the soul that is the mind or the spirit, it only exists. And so very strangely, you know, we're sitting here talking about the immortality of the soul, the deathlessness of the soul. Amo ends up in the same place that, for example, Descartes does by saying that the soul exists, but does not live. The soul doesn't, right? The, it, the mind is active. It doesn't ta take sensation. Well, if the definition of life is to have sensation, the mind isn't going to be alive. It's going to be lifeless. That means, however, for Amo, it's also going to be deathless. The soul never dies. If you're not alive, you can't die. Now, this is very strange because most people, when they think about the soul, they think of the soul being alive after death. I mean, Plato's discussion, so the pre-Christian Platonic discussion, many discussions of the immortality of the soul see the soul as a living soul, as an alive soul. 
Amo, it's much more radical view. In, in a sense, he's a he's a more serious and more consistent rationalist than most of the rest of these guys. He's like, look, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Which, you know, for a philosopher, right or wrong, uh, you got to admire and respect his his um, his intellectual rigor on this. He said, look, <laughs> sorry, but if we're going to have this view, we have to do it this way because this is the consistent way. So. The mind is active in its interactions with the body. It's acting on the body by thinking about it. People are disembodied minds or souls. So actual people, humans, not humans, but people, are the minds or the souls, not their bodies. The body lives because it senses. So anything that has sensation is alive. The soul doesn't have sensation. So it, it's not alive. It just exists like the stone. He, and Alma actually compares it to a rock or a stone. The rock or a stone exists, but it's not alive because it doesn't have, it's not sentient. It doesn't have sensations. For Amal, the soul is like that. The soul doesn't have sensations. It is lifeless, but that means it's also deathless, which means it's immortal. Also for Amo, race and racial difference characterizes bodies only. There is no racial difference when it comes to minds or souls. This is, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a view that a lot of his contemporaries and people after Amo share. People's souls and minds don't have racial difference. Racial difference is entirely a bodily thing, a, a thing about a phenotypical, genetic, physical thing. So if you're distinguishing between body and soul, body, mind and body, and you assign race only to body, it means that there isn't racial difference when it comes to souls. For Amo, only bodies are enslaved. You can't enslave someone's soul. You can't enslave somebody's mind or spirit. That's another fairly common view. Um, obviously, it, it, it produces complications. You can see, I mean, it, it supports the argument either way. Um, for Amo, that means that the mind or the soul is free. The body can be enslaved, but the soul or the mind is always free. You can't enslave it, right? You, can, you, you can't enslave it. Um, and as I've suggested already, I just this is this is what this note is here. The active soul and the passive body are echoed in 17th and 18th century metaphysics. Um, matter is inert, inactive, and it requires a spiritual active cause in order for it to be in motion. So all of this question of like, why is anything moving in the world? Also, why does anything happen? And we'll see this when we get to Bentley in particular and Newton. Also, why does anything have any particular shape or form or order or regularity to it? some active cause had to put it into motion because matter could never get there by itself. Matter could never fall into some sort of regular, consistent pattern of activity by itself. It has to be put into motion by an active cause, and active causes can only be spiritual, non-material. Okay, more on that in a bit. Now for Descartes, for Descartes, the mind or soul, as for Amo, is distinct from the body, but, and this is the major departure, this is the, this is the, this is the view that Descartes has that um, Amo disagrees with, that he departs from, and he's quite critical in the dissertation, uh, Adamson points this out, he's quite critical in his dissertation, the impassivity book, um, of this view of Descartes. For Descartes, the, the, mind in the, the, the mind and the body, or the soul and the body, are connected it's not just that they interact with act, active mind acting on the body by thinking about it, by intending its sensations, um, but they're actually connected. And they're connected um, in, a, in a gland. It's actually a real gland. It really exists. This is something that the dissection, the, uh, to you know, cast your mind back to the, anatom the anatomist that we were looking at, the, um, the anatomical scientist that we were looking at early, a, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, these people had like identified different glands and so on, and one of them is called the pineal gland, um, P-I-N-E-A-L. The pineal gland is, for Descartes, the place where the soul is connected to the body. It's like they're totally distinct and separate, but they're connected at the pineal gland. Um, that means that for Descartes, sensations that affect the body, so like if you hit your elbow on the doorframe or you stub your toe or you, know, you see the light, you hear my voice, 
all of those sensations that are happening to your body also happen to your soul. They also affect the soul. The effects of bodily sensation on the mind, that is what happens when, when the body has sensations and thus the mind has sensations, that those effects are one kind of idea for Descartes. Descartes in the third meditation, which I didn't make you read, um, gives a classification of his different kinds of ideas. This ends up being um, an essential part of his argument for the, for the existence of God, which is what the third meditation is about. Um, that te- the meditations, third, third and fourth meditations are actually up on, on e-reserve, but I didn't, I didn't require you to read them. But if you get curious, you can certainly look at them. So there's a, there's a classification of ideas. One kind are ideas, things that come from the outside, things that come to the mind through the body. Oh, light is coming to my eyes. It's hitting my eyes from the outside of me, body and soul. And because my soul is connected to my body, my pineal gland, my soul is going, oh yeah, there's light in my eyes and I can see colors and Kathy waving her hands. Um, Ideas are thus effects which have causes. So an idea for Descartes is a thing that, it's an effect, it's, it's, a, it's an effect, it's a thing that needs an explanation. It's like, well, where did you get this idea from? Where did this come from? You, you can't, you could, this couldn't have come up on its own. It's got to have a cause. How do we explain it? Let's go find that cause. That is the, in my view, the most powerful explanatory mechanism that Descartes uses in the meditations for the, um, for uh, the immortality of the soul and for um, the existence of God. And I'll mention that briefly towards the end of the lecture. Um, ideas are effects that have causes. And then, and what that means is we can know those causes. We can, we can locate those causes. We can say, oh, okay, so these ideas have these causes. And in the case of bodily sensations, we know that you know some object outside of us has 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 impinged on us whether it's light in our eyes or sound in our ears or you know some material object on our um on our skin um these all of these things have causes that we can then ascertain become certain about know about um descartes dualism is less radical than amos um it's more famous the body suffers sensations and that mind suffers along with it. Again, big departure from um, Amo's view. And Adamson lays this out in some detail in the, in, in the podcast. Um, people, persons, are instead conjoined souls and bodies. They're united. Um, but Descartes' cogito ergo sum, this is the I think therefore I am argument, which we saw in the second meditation, this makes certain knowledge of oneself depend on the soul only. So here, Descartes says, the mind and the body are connected, but if we're gonna know something with certainty, and he does this for other objects and everything else as well, if we're gonna know something with certainty, we have to know it with our souls, or we have to know it, same thing, with our minds. Nothing that comes to us through the body is something that we can know by itself is something we can know certainly. And you might be asking, okay, well, wait a minute. If the cause of at least some of our ideas are are, our sensations of like things outside of us, how can we possibly know them without the body? And that's the lesson of the um, example of um, the wax um, that Descartes gives us in the in the back part of the second meditation. And I'll talk some more about that um, in just a second. Knowledge of what we are depends on the soul only, Descartes says, and the body is a source of error. The body is a source of error. The way this works, um, and I'm going to step this argument here in, in a couple of detail, in, 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 in detail in a couple of moments, but the way this works is that our knowledge of our soul is immediate. It's not mediated by a sensation that's coming from the body. Um, Whereas, say, you know, the not my knowledge that there is like, you know, there's a wall, you actually can't see this, there's a wall, there's a wall here, there's a wall here. And um, your knowledge that you have, you know, light hitting your eyes, and you can hear my voice and all the rest of that, you know, you're currently watching a lecture on, um, you know, via video and so forth. Um, those and then I at some point I was giving it right. Um, your those those kinds of those kinds of sensations that tell you about those things that's also a source of error you know it's sort of hit or miss whether you're getting the right thing and most importantly for Descartes those kinds of reports from the body if you will 
they change and that's and if you so now think about the wax example the wax is hard and cold and small before Descartes picks it up and moves it towards the fire it gets warmer it gets larger it gets softer it actually starts to turn from solid into liquid if you really went to town it would start to evaporate and turn into a you know vapor um all of those changes are recorded by, you know, our eyes and our skin when we're touching it and our noses and so forth. You know, the smells change and so on. And we can smell the flowers, as he says, um, differently in, in, in these different stages. So the wax is something that can change a great deal. And Descartes says, well, look, I, I, how can I possibly know this thing? How can I possibly know this thing since it seems to be like multiple things? It, it changes all the time. How do I know what wax is if it shows up in all these different ways? I don't, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't understand that. And, you know, you can think about, you know, very young children before you've explained to them that water, for example, can come in the form of liquid, ice, or something like fog or steam coming out of the kettle. All of that's water. It's just in a different state. Very young children don't know that. They haven't had that explained, but it's all the same thing. Just, you know, try to cast your mind back in, you know, st stand in their shoes for a second and try to imagine, okay, this is very weird. Someone's telling me that all of those three things are the same water. So, you know, uh, uh, like in Texas a few weeks ago, people were going out there and getting frozen water in the form of snow because you know, their pipes burst and they didn't have any water because of, in my view, the evil, terrible things that people do to regular people when it comes to provision of basic needs. Um, uh, they were bringing frozen water in in the form of snow. They were melting it on, you know, on, on, um, uh, on barbecue grills and propane stoves and so on, because they didn't have any power either. They were melting it to get liquid. And, you know, in some cases they had to boil it um, in order to consume it for food or drink. Um, uh, and when they boil it, steam would rise. Well, that's, that's imag imagine, like, okay, wait a minute, that's all the same thing? That's all three different kinds, three different, completely very different states? And it's all the same thing? That's, and even to understand weather patterns, you'd have to recognize that as well, right? That the water in the ocean, the rain falling, the fog, the snow, the frost on the ground, all that, all, all that same substance, but boy, it seems different in different cases. So how can you know a thing that's so different in, from one stage to the next? And what Descartes, the approach he takes very simply with the example of the wax, is to eliminate everything that he's getting from his senses. He just, he just says, I can't tell whether this is the true version of the wax. Is it the hard cold? small thing or is it the larger uh, uh softer um warmer thing or is it this liquid here like at the top of the candle is it the liquid or is it the vapor that when it gets really hot that start that starts to appear i mean which is it he just eliminates all that and he says well what have i got left what do all these different forms of this wax have in common and what they have in common is what um these guys call uh extension it's, it's what these guys call extension. It's a it's a philosopher word, um, and and people will unthinkingly use it all the time, like it like it it's clear. It simply means that it is extended in three dimensions in space, or in two. It's extended in three dimensions in space. It it takes up space. Is what is what is what it means for something to be extended. It means that it's not um, it's not like a like your idea of. Um, well, I don't know, your idea of what happened last week. So that's in your mind now, right? So think about something that happened last week. Um, you're thinking about that. That's fine. Whatever it is in the present, it's not taking up space in your mind. It, it's not taking up space in the world. It's not taking up physical space. It's taking up, you know, neurons. That's something else. But it's not the, the like, so, so remember, try to remember what you had for breakfast a couple of days ago. Well, it, you know, been and gone, that breakfast, right? Um, it, it did take up space. It was there on the counter or on the table or, you know, coming out of the toaster oven or whatever it is. But you ate it and digested it and you know, did whatever you're going to do with it. And two days on, while you can remember that it used to be extended, the idea of it, which is something else, is, is, is not a thing that takes up space in the world. You, can, you know, it's a, it's a, it refers to and is about something that takes up space, but it's just an idea. Other things like, you know, um, two plus two equals four doesn't take up any space in the world. It's just an idea. It's just a concept. Um, what the wax is that Descartes can be certain of is, or well, he can't be certain of it yet, 
um, at the end of the second meditation. He can be more certain about that than he can about hardness or softness or warmth or cold or liquid or solid. Those, the, that's even that's less certain. What he can be more certain about is that the wax is, ex- is an extended thing. He says he knows that fact about the wax and about anything, any material objects, because that's what matter is. It is extended. That's the definition of matter for these guys. It's inert, inactive, and extended in three dimensions however small, right? Um, this includes like the atoms that the, the, these that these guys have an idea of, which I've mentioned in passing. We'll see some more about that um, when we get, come back to Descartes in a couple weeks. Um, this, it's, that, it's extended, but Descartes said, I only figured that out. I only learned about that by ignoring my senses, by ignoring what my senses were telling me about the wax and only paying attention to what stayed in my mind after I got rid of everything I got from the body. So for Descartes, he knew the wax by his mind only, by his mind only. That means that he says, okay, that, that's, a, that's guidance. He can't be totally sure about this because he's in the middle of his demon hypothesis, right? Um, which he gives us in, at the end of the first meditation, the evil genius that is, 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 that is making you believe these things, even though they're all false. None of them are true, but it's, and, uh, you, can, you can think of the matrix if you've seen the matrix, or you can think about brains in a vat. You can think about all kinds of different, different ways to sort of realize this or, or, or uh, describe it or uh, illustrate it. Um, the soul here is the source of knowledge and certain, certain knowledge of things, where the body is a source of error. So all that other stuff we were getting from the wax, hard, soft, the smell of it, the side of it, all of that stuff was maybe, but extension stayed. And we learned that through reason, not from, not from the senses, but for use of our reason. That's a more certain form of knowledge. We'll see when we look in a little bit more detail for a second at the at the now at the cogito argument at the at the at the argument he gives us in the in the in the second meditation earlier in the second meditation that um, Descartes is um, he's playing he's 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 adopting an older tradition an older view of the of sense experience of um, of the experience of the mind um, of the body. Of the body and and for him the mind because unlike amo for descartes the the mind suffers along with the body it has sensations along with the body what happens when he when he when he subjects his um his 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 uh, question about himself to his evil demon hypothesis is that he discovers not a new kind of sensation because it doesn't involve the body but it's got the status of it's got the status of something that he can't argue with it's not it's not something he can have a rational argument with he can't he can't defeat it um, so we can see, and I'll do some more of that detail in just a second, we can see that in, in the way Descartes sets this up, that th- what philosophers call the fear of error drives Descartes significantly. He's very worried that everything he thinks is false. Well, he's very worried that some of what he believes is false. Or, and I mean, the, the subtext of that is he thinks that there are people out in the world who are his readers who think things are, think things that are false. And so the solution to that is, the cure of that is to say, okay, well, what are the, what's the criterion or what are the criteria by which we can have certain knowledge? Because if we can identify those things, we can just put everything else in the penalty box and we can just be sure about those few things. Well, you already know where he's going with this. The certain things for now are going to be the immortality of the soul and the existence of God. Although by the end of the all six meditations, Descartes also brings back the physical world, and we can be we can be certain about this. But that's only after we've established that God isn't a deceiver again. Um, that can't happen until after the third meditation. Uh, so fear of error plays a major role in his meditations. But what's really going on then is his is is, is the development of these arguments for the immortality of the soul and the um, the uh, the existence of God. He he wants these things to be absolutely certain, inarguable, something we just, we can't resist that. We can't resist that. um, We can't resist those claims. Sorry. Both Amo and Descartes' dualisms 
make up the part of the modern philosophical tradition that is first theological and makes the soul, which is the mind, right, more real than the body. The soul is more real in, in a certain way than the body. This echoes the Christian theological tradition of locating sin, which is, that, which is to say original sin, the, the consequences of, of the situation in the Garden of Eden in the Genesis books, right? Um, locate sin with the body, and it reserves the afterlife of rewards and punishments for the soul. So sin is original sin. It, it, it attaches to people when they're born into a body. After they die, their soul continues after them. Um, uh, for Amo, it's because the soul isn't alive and can't die. For Descartes, it's because it is, it, it, it's alive but immortal. Um, and in that afterlife, that is where the rewards and punishments for either a good or bad life come from. And this is, you know, this is the bedrock of moral philosophy and ethics in this period for these people. And it is for t many people today. I mean, you've, you've heard these arguments. You can't have a moral life if you don't believe in an afterlife and in a God which will reward and punish people. If, I mean, if people didn't think they would get in trouble after they were dead, they'd do all kinds of crazy things. Um, they, would, they would think they could get away with it in some you know, larger existential sense. Um, so that the only way to, to keep human beings moral is to have them believing in an afterlife of rewards and punishments. This kind of dualism, the theological aspect of this strand of modern philosophy, also, however, locates racial difference, other bodily differences, for example, like sex or gender, um, ethnicity, all kinds of things, all those differences, it locates those differences with the body also. So along with sin, and you can see this in some of the, um, in some of the, uh, in both the polygenesis and the monogenesis, the, the polygenetic and the monogenetic racial theories, that, 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 you know, being made to be a certain race is a kind of reward or punishment for a certain lifestyle or a certain status or a certain way of being in the world. That happens to the, that happens to the body in life, right? The soul on this view, souls are identical. They're raceless, sexless, and sinless after, you know, after they've been, you know, subjected to grace and so forth. I mean, they're not necessarily sinless. I mean, you can, people can be sent to hell because they're, they're they, 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 I've either refused or have for some reason made grace unavailable or depending on your theological views, they were never going to get it anyway. Um, uh, but, but, um, he, what this does is it locates sin and racial difference and sex difference and all these other differences among people in the body as opposed to the soul, which underwrites a lot of the anti-slavery arguments that say, hey, you know, you can't do this to people because these are actually, and in the European setting, it tends to be, these are Christian souls in, because men, you know, people, people, um, people at, 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 like Amo, like Coguano, Equiano, all these guys that we that we were talking about, but also people that are, you know, obviously in existence because of the regulation that we, um, the regulations we read about in the in the Henning statutes, laws of colonial Virginia. The conversion to Christianity was a common experience um, for um, people who were kidnapped um, from Africa and brought to the West Indies and to other parts of the Americas, as well as to Europe. The conversion to Christianity, baptism, all of these, all of these. Um, uh, events in people's lives turned them into Christian souls in the view of the church, um, even though it didn't exempt them from slavery in the eyes of the law in, in the American South and in the West Indies, right? Um, they had to, they had, but, it, but you saw that. They had to make a special regulation. Baptism doesn't get you out of this. Um, it so, th so this notion that, that souls don't have racial difference, it supports an argument that you really shouldn't be enslaving these people because those differences are only, the racial differences are only in the bodies. It's not about their souls. The souls are free. You can't enslave the soul. Adamson points out, though, that's got another dimension to it. That's got another dimension to it. It's like, well, okay, if you can't enslave their souls, what's the problem with enslaving their bodies? Who cares? And if the mind doesn't suffer along with the soul, if the, if, the, if the soul or the mind or the spirit doesn't suffer along, sorry, with the body, when you're like, so when you were enslaving the body and doing terrible things to the body in the context of slavery or what have you, if the soul isn't suffering that way, what's the problem? So, and Adamson points that out, it's, it's like, a, oh, wait, well, let's, not, let's not go there um, in terms of your anti-slavery arguments. However, there's another aspect of this that is... 
more alive in our time and is more insidious and more pervasive in the Western philosophical tradition. This is, this is in a sense what, I mean, the, the, the immediate issue of slavery was what preoccupied people writing in the 17th, the 18th, and 19th centuries. Um, later, in the 20th and 21st centuries, you know, the European, Anglo-American, Western philosophical tradition proceeds, there's another, there's another sort of racist dimension of this particular philosophical view that the soul, the mind, the body, raceless, sexless, don't, don't, don't have these differences. It actually makes possible the following. It supports, as I mentioned, anti-racist and anti-slavery arguments like Amos and Kuguanos, but it also um, founds a very powerful philosophical tradition, this tradition here, that sees its claims about the soul or the mind as universal, objective, neutral, rational, and true. So when these European philosophers, and they are overwhelmingly men, and they are, with a couple of exceptions, European men, which today we would call them white men, um, white Europeans, um, when they describe the soul and they say these are its qualities and this is what a good soul looks like as opposed to a bad soul and this is this is what people should be doing and these are the moral consequences of having a soul like this and these are the appropriate activities and the appropriate positions and so forth of of people with souls like this when they do that they import their own sense of what it is to be like a good soul or a soul at all, and that ends up being both very European and very male, primarily. And there are long traditions now, longer traditions, particularly, you know, in, 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 the, in the 19th century, definitely in the 20th century, and, you know, continuing much more robustly into the 21st century, big traditions um, inside philosophy of people criticizing the assumptions that these guys made about, you know, here they are saying, oh, well, the, you know, everyone's got a soul like this. It's neutral, it's objective, it's universal. It's, well, well, no, it's not. It's actually it's more ethnically Euro European and you're just not copying to that because you're not aware. This is kind of like, you might call it like big philosophical implicit bias um, in, in, in one sense. Like they, they don't even, they're not even aware that they're seeing the world this way. They just think, oh, well, this is, well, at the same time, and this is, this is you know, this is the bad faith part of this. At the same time, these guys also saw traditionally women as um, lesser, inferior, um, uh, lacking their souls just didn't have it going on the way men's souls did, nor did children's souls, and nor did the souls of um, especially non-Europeans. So they're making, they're actually making both assumptions and both arguments simultaneously that are contradictory. And, and it, so it's not pretty no matter what you, no matter how we look at it. But I wanted you to see all the different sort of ways this goes wrong in the tradition and how long that lasts. This notion that Western philosophical views of the nature of human beings is objective, universal, scientific, and so on. I mean, science is coming into existence and all these scientific descriptions are coming down the pike. It's like, oh, well, we've got this. Um, well, it turns out not so much, actually. Y you end up producing a much more ethnically specific tradition, but unpacking that and sort of tracing out how that's true and incorporating the hist histories and traditions and life experiences of other cultures um, and people in those cultures, it's forced changes to this kind of thing. Although I would say to you that most of the profession actually doesn't have the memo yet. And so philosophy, philosophy still needs a lot of work. Philosophy still needs a lot of work. It's had sort of a lot of radical, radical uh, updating lately, but it's, but, but, but it's still in progress. It's still in progress. Okay. So as I've said, Descartes' skepticism, which we see him advancing in the first meditation, is one step in this extended argument that God exists, exists that the soul is distinct from the body, as distinct from the body, is a source of truth, um, and that skeptical arguments about God and the soul and truth are defeated by their own terms. Now, what's going on here? Why does Descartes, um, I mean, I've given you some motivations for why he'd start with his skepticism, but I haven't stepped that out for you. And I need now to give you sort of the historical backdrop for this because Descartes is, um, Descartes is doing what, 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 what you might characterize as a kind of jujitsu move on um, the tradition that uh, he, you know, confronts as somebody in the, um, in the, in the early 17th century. 
remembering that the meditations themselves were published in 1641. Um, in the course of the Renaissance and after and later, I mentioned, to the, mentioned this to you a number of weeks ago, um, Europe rediscovered classical texts of important philosophical and other medical scientific texts of um, both Greece and Rome, that is the older ancient classical world. Europe at some point rediscovers these things after its own so-called dark ages. I mean, this is, um, they're not dark ages for the Islamic tradition, but they are dark ages for the Christian medieval tradition, um, where pretty much all they have going on is Christian theology and, um, uh, you know, a little bit of Aristotle. They, they, they haven't discovered much um, or re recovered much by way of the earlier traditions. One of the things that gets discovered, and it shows up in Europe in the 16th century, um, like in, in, the, in the 1540s, 50s, 60s, is um, a very famous, a very famous and very, a very uh, devastating um, little book, big book, by um, a guy called Sextus Empiricus by a, he's a he's a he's a greek he's a person writing in greek but he's he, he's he's a, he lives in rome he's a roman so he's in that sort of intermediate period between the greek and roman uh traditions um what's called peronian skepticism um uh, the title of sextus book is outlines of pyrrhonism it's a reference to this earlier greek figure named pyrrho um uh, it appears in 1562 in Greek. In 1567, there's a Latin translation. Um, this is the most dangerous kind of skepticism that shows up in the Western tradition. Uh, skepticism is usually seen as um, just a rejection of, of, of a particular claim or of all claims, possibly. Um, so you, a religious skeptic will say there is no God, and we'll call that skeptic an atheist. Um, or a... Um, a something is what the what the ancient world called an academic skeptics because these skeptics were coming out of plato's academy uh in the later greek philosophical tradition um these guys said uh we can know nothing we can know nothing and that produces the paradoxical situation that they're claiming to know this one thing that they know nothing and it's got self-referential problems and that's always fun um it's got it's it has an issue though with the consistency with consistency because the, they're asserting a knowledge claim we can know nothing um, or nothing is true except this statement, or including this statement. Um, the Peronian skeptic was much more devastating. The Peronian skeptic um, was was absolutely committed to truth and wanted truth in particular. And this is this is influenced primarily by the earlier Stoic tradition, the Greek Stoic tradition. Um, the Peronian skeptic wanted peace of mind. The, the, the Peronian skeptic wanted um, freedom from the conflicts. Uh, and, you know, this is something we're actually fairly familiar with. Wow, I wish I didn't have to listen to all these arguments, whether they're family arguments or political arguments or arguments about lockdowns or masks or all of these things. Um, I just, I don't want to hear the arguments anymore. I just want peace. I just want to be left alone. I don't want to have to worry about this. Well, the Peronian skeptic is like that, but for philosophical and log logical arguments. Like, no. How, okay, and, but then instead of sort of walking away from the substance, the, the Peronian skeptic says, you know what, the thing that would give me peace of mind here is to know the truth once and for all, the truth that like becomes certain, so certain that no one can argue with it. And then we could all just sort of say, oh, thank goodness. Now, you know, all right, we've got this. We don't have to fight about this anymore. So the Peronian skeptic develops a method for investigating truth claims to find out whether because if you're if you're sincere and saying look i don't have the truth yet but i really really want it you've got a couple of issues you've got to keep looking for it and it's got to be a good faith investigation and you have to realize that you don't actually you know you have to hope you'll know you know you'll know it when you see it because you can't even be sure that the criteria that you go out into the world with to investigate it um are reliable like maybe you've got the wrong criteria that's another thing you can't be sure about and about which we can have big long arguments so we're definitely not going to go there and so what the peronian skeptic does is develop a method of investigation of every truth claim of every claim that anybody advances as okay here this is true and what the skeptic does is try to find out whether or not um, there is ground for doubt 
I'm summarizing hundreds of pages of method very quickly, whether there's ground for doubt in, in um, a, particular, a particular claim to truth, somebody's belief. And what the what the Peronian skeptic does is investigate the alternatives. So, you know, this is you know this is true or is it false? And the Peronian skeptic investigates the investigate. Well, is it is it is today Monday or is today Tuesday? Well, let's you know let's look into it. Let's let's find out. Again, summarizing madly, over the course of that investigation, the Peronian skeptic can actually produce produce enough sort of uncertainty, we wouldn't characterize it as practical uncertainty. I mean, you and I every every week say, okay, we're going today's, I'm going to go with today being Tuesday. There's not really much good in, you know, developing a practical uncertainty about this. But in terms of whether it's like really Tuesday, um, we're, you know, we, we, we don't we don't hold ourselves up practically on this case. And actually the, the Peronian skeptics didn't either. I'll talk about that in a second. What the Peronian skeptic does is that, well, it might actually be Wednesday and I can actually come up with arguments and evidence that it's Wednesday. And they're, you know, they're running a pretty close competition. It's not, maybe, maybe it's a little lopsided, but it's, it's definitely running a competition with the claim that it's Tuesday. And so, wait a minute, is it Wednesday or is it Tuesday? And the skeptic says, look, it's really scary to pick one of these because neither of them are coming in as completely certain. Why? Because the other side's got stuff going on too, in both directions. The safest thing for me to do, not as a practical matter, but it's a matter of like, am I going to assert that this is the this is the certain truth? I don't have to do it for practical matters. So what am I going to do instead of like going out into the world, you know, believing that believing that um, uh, 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 the world is founded on an elephant or that um, today is you know today is today is Tuesday when it's really Wednesday or Wednesday when it's really Tuesday. Instead of instead of like holding on to one of these you know for dear life and saying oh no it's going to be this, I not for practical purposes. Again, I suspend judgment. I'm going to, I'm going to, because it's too dangerous to pick one of these because it could have been the other one that was, that was true. I'm going to suspend judgment. This suspension of judgment after an investigation of the relative merits of different claims about sub particular subjects ends up being the most devastating thing philosophy has ever produced for knowledge claims, for certain kinds of knowledge claims, for certain kinds of knowledge claims. Now, as I mentioned, the ancient skeptics, there are guidelines. Anything that comes to us involuntarily, you don't have to assert that it's true, but you go with it. So if you're hungry, you eat. If you're, um, the customs of the country require you to um, pray at these particular times, you do that. Um, if, you, if you're ordered off to war by the, by the emperor, you go and you fight in the war. Like you do a whole bunch of like pretty serious stuff um, without necessarily believing anything in particular about it. So that, so it's, um, you're not you're not doing those things dogmatically. You are um, you're just following the dictates of nature, the customs of the country, um, the, the the political requirements of where you live, and so on. It actually makes for sort of ethical couch potatoes. You know, other people are deciding what's good and bad in terms of practical actions. The Peronian skeptics are not weighing in on that because they can't ascertain absolute truth. What happens is, the good faith Peronian skeptic you know, has to just sort of suffer this. The bad faith Peronian skeptic says, hey, this is great. I can destroy everything this way. Peronian skepticism makes it impossible to assert that anything is true. Makes it impossible because you can always entertain doubts. You can always find some ground for doubt. And if you can find a ground for doubt, the, the Peronian skeptic, the method says, you need to suspend judgment. You need to hold off. And what happened, what the Peronian skeptic found was that when she, she, he, whatever, suspended judgment, she got the peace of mind she was looking for. She's like, oh, okay, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good, you know, door prize, booby prize, right? I didn't get the peace of mind that I would get if I got absolute truth, but this suspending judgment thing is actually pretty great. <laughs> I mean, I'm not lazy. I'm going to keep on inquiring. I'm going to keep looking into arguments and seeing, you know, I'm going to keep investigating because I still want, you know, the really serious peace of mind that comes with truth, but I'll take this provisional stuff just to get a break. And so suspending judgment on things, it's like, you know, I actually don't, and we do this, we do this, and you guys are probably learning to do this in your part of your life. You realize, you know what? I don't have a dog in this race. I don't have to fight about this. I don't have to get involved in this argument. Family arguments, especially, it's like, wait a minute. I don't have to get involved in this. It doesn't really matter. You know, I, I'm not sure whether this is the case or that's the case. These guys are going at it, hammer and tongs, the old expression. Um, I, I'm going to suspend judgment. I don't know. And you learn to say, I don't know. I don't know. 
And that's what the Peronian skeptic does. And that brings with it a kind of peace of mind that is similar to the Stoic peace of mind that's, that's sort of the end of the, the objective of their, ethic, their, their ethical life. Um, okay, but when this, when this, that's a pre-Christian Greek and Roman skeptical tradition, when Sextus Empiricus outlines of Peronism is rediscovered in Europe in um, the 16th century, Religion, which is already threatened by the new science, as we've seen in weeks previous, um, with its alternate explanations of um, natural phenomena, that's the dispute over cause and of claims about causes for particular effects. Is it the, are pandemics caused by the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, or are they caused by a virus, and so on, right? Um, th these explanations for natural phenomena, and by the rise of disagreement and atheism in and around the battles of Reformation, Right. So that so that so that the split like the split between Sunni and Shia in the Islamic world that we see, the split between Catholicism and Protestantism produced a lot of disagreement. They were arguing about what the Bible said, about what people should do in relation to the biblical text. They were arguing about what brought about grace and what 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 what, what was appropriate for faith, all kinds of things. Churches split the huge but wars, hundreds of years of wars and all that business. Well, that people looked at that and some of them just said, forget it. I'm not doing this. You know, a pox on both your houses. That's a reference to Shakespeare, um, and it it produced more disagreement and more atheism. So that so Christian theological doctrine it was sort of fighting wars on a couple of different fronts here already. Um, Peronian skepticism shows up in the middle of this, and it provides more um, ammunition for atheistical arguments. However, it also provides am ammunition for people on both sides of the Protestant Catholic debate. I'm not going to bore you with all of those details, but people pick that up and say, hey, this is great. And they use different, they use, they use different dimensions of that argument. One, one notable one, one very important one is that um, it's a very long tradition. The Catholic Church picked up Peronian skepticism and said, hey, this is great. We can get rid of rational arguments for the existence of God altogether, which means we can get rid of rational arguments against the existence of God altogether. So that the effect of Peronian skepticism was to clear away all of the science and the rational argument and make room for faith. And so that, so that faith, something called fideism, is an alternative to truths held because of rational argument. And the Catholic Church says, that, that's exactly what we need. This, this, this Peronian skepticism, Sextus Empiricus, is fabulous. It, it basically gets the mind ready for religious faith. We can see this we won't, we won't see it this semester, but at the end of the modern period, at the end, and I've mentioned this um, in passing previously, when Immanuel Kant makes his distinction between the phenomenal and noumenal worlds, and when, in, when he does so, um, locates science and all of its causal explanations in the phenomenal world and says, we can't know anything about the noumenal world. It's a mystery. Um, it's not accessible to us. We don't have experience of it. Um, he says he's found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Well, the knowledge he's denying is the knowledge of the things, what he calls things in themselves, things that we can be absolutely certain about, things that are absolutely true and unchanging and all the rest of this. That's the noumenal world. We don't even, one, many, whatever it is, we have no idea. All of the other stuff we know in the phenomenal world, but Kant locates faith and the objects of faith, doesn't call them objects, in the noumenal world, it's also for those of you who've read Kant's uh, ethical, moral philosophy. That's where he. That's that. It's also the realm of ends. It's it's what you're thinking about when um, you're following the categorical imperative. Um, I mean, you're not thinking about it, but it's it's out there as like um, constitutive for your thought, even though you can't know anything about it. So when Kant, Kant denies knowledge in order to make room for faith, here at the end of this long development, he's invoking this distinction that the Catholic Church picks up in centuries previously. It's like, wait a minute, Pyrrhonism is wonderful. We can just like push all the science and all the logical, rational argument over here, and that clears out this space for religious faith. So Descartes, though, makes a different use of Peronian skepticism, um, because one of the things, as I mentioned, that the Peronians don't dispute are um, things that come to them involuntarily. Now, in that case, I was talking about, you know, the conventions of things like calendars that say today is Wednesday as opposed to Tuesday or vice versa. You know, when you feel hungry, you should eat. Um, when, um, uh, you know, when it's cold, go inside, um, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, but the, but the, 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 what, the, what the skeptic does is 
recognize that some things come to us not as uh, dogmatic beliefs, but instead as involuntary sensations, sensations in the sense of pass passivity. You, you, you can't help it. It's, it's involuntary. You're passive in relation to it, to it. All of the things that I, this list of illustrations I've given you earlier in this lecture, the sound of my voice right now, the sight of me waving my hands, you know, put, you know, if you're sitting on the bed or you're sitting on the chair, the feeling of the feeling of the piece of furniture against your legs, right? That, that touch sensation, the sound of my voice in your ears, the sight of my hands waving, you know, bite into an apple, the taste of the apple,